Has it ever seemed surprising to you that when Jesus came to our world about 2,000 years ago, that even though the Jews had looked for the Messiah to come for over 1,500 years, that none of the Jewish leaders proclaimed His birth to the world or were even aware of what was happening? Does history repeat itself? Stay tuned. We'll see. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Bible prophecy presents to us, as we saw in a previous program, the startling fact that our world is not going to keep on going on and on and on, but the world as we know it is going to come to an end. The reign of evil, the rule of evil is going to come to an end. Not only can we know that the fact that it is coming to an end and sin and destruction and evil will someday be completely destroyed, but also we can know from Bible prophecy when to expect these events to happen, when they will be near. We're going to look at this in just a few moments, but first let's pray and ask the Lord to help us by His Holy Spirit to understand what we are going to study from Bible prophecy. Father in heaven, we thank you for Bible prophecy that gives us hope for the future, that explains what has happened in the past and helps us to be ready for what is going to come upon our world as an overwhelming surprise. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for watching today's program. We would like to send you a free book entitled The End of the World. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC32. Have you ever wondered who the final generation will be? What will be their experience? What does the Bible have to say about this important subject? For answers to these questions, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC32. And now, Pastor John Grossball. The long rule of evil in our world that has gone on now for about 6,000 years is going to come to an end. Not only is it going to come to an end, but it is going to come to an end soon. That is relatively soon. I didn't say this week or this month or this year, but in a relatively short period of time compared with the length of time of the great controversy between good and evil in our world, the world as we know it is going to come to an end and the reign, the glorious worldwide reign of the Messiah is going to begin. At that time, of course, all those from all past ages, from all over the world who have died in Christ will be resurrected and given the gift of eternal life. This is something that the children of God have looked forward to with longing anticipation for thousands of years. The Bible talks about how Abraham and Sarah looked forward to this event. Bible prophecy not only tells us the manner and the object of Christ's second coming to our world, but Bible prophecy also gives us tokens by which we can know when this event is approaching. Now, as you would expect, a controversy that has continued for 6,000 years, when you come up to the last few hundred years of that controversy, you are approaching the end. Jesus gave us some signs. Notice what Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, when he was talking about his return to this world, he said, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. What signs were there going to be? Well, we look in Mark 13, 24 to 26. What signs were there going to be in the sun and the moon and the stars? It says, Mark 13, 24 to 26, 
But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Power and glory. Now in the book of Revelation, John the Revelator, by inspiration, gives to us, describes for us the very first of these signs that were to occur, that would precede, that would come before the second advent. These signs were to be of a nature that nobody with a candid mind looking at the evidence could overlook them or deny them. They were signs that would occur in the earth and in the heavens. Notice how this first sign of the coming of Christ is described in Revelation, the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse. It says, it has a context here which we will not look at, but it happened exactly at the time described. Revelation 6, 12 says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Notice the first sign that was given that would tell the world that the coming of Christ was near was to be a great earthquake. Now there have been many earthquakes down through recorded history, but this was to be a great earthquake. We would great expect the greatest earthquake that has ever been experienced up to that time. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, these signs that we read about in Revelation 6, 12 that corroborate what Jesus said in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, these signs have already been witnessed. They were witnessed, in fact, before the opening of the 19th century in fulfillment of this prophecy, Revelation 6, 12. There occurred in the year 1755, the most terrible earthquake that had ever been recorded up to that time. Now this is commonly called, if you look at an encyclopedia, it's commonly called the Lisbon earthquake. However, this was not just a, an earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal. This earthquake extended to the greater part of Europe and Africa and even to America. It was felt in Greenland, in the West Indies, in the island of Madeira, in Norway and Sweden and Great Britain and Ireland. This earthquake pervaded an extent of not less than four million miles. To give you a, four million square miles, to give you a little idea about how big a territory that would be, that is well, in addition, well greater than all the territory in the 48 continental United States. In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as in Europe. Cities were destroyed. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing great destruction. But it was in Spain and in Portugal that the earthquake had its most extreme violence. At Lisbon, here's what happened. It's called the Lisbon earthquake for this reason. He says, a, <coughs> we're reading now from the historical account. It says, a sound of thunder was heard underground and immediately afterwards a violent shock threw down the greater part of that city. In the course of about six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. The sea first retired and laid the bar dry. It then rolled in rising 50 feet or more above its ordinary level. The shock of this earthquake was instantly followed by the fall of every church and convent and almost all of the large public buildings and more than one-fourth of the houses. About two hours after this earthquake, the initial shock, Fires broke out in different sections of the city and raged with such violence for the space of nearly three days that the city was completely desolated. Now this earthquake happened on a holy day when the churches and convents were full of people. 
very few of which escaped. You can read about that in the American Encyclopedia. The terror of the people was beyond description. They ran here and there, delirious with horror and astonishment, beating their faces and their breasts. They cried that the world was at an end. Mothers forgot their children, and they ran about loaded with crucifixed images. Unfortunately, many ran to the churches for protection, but in vain was the sacrament exposed. In vain did these poor people embrace the altars because the altars, the images, the priests, and the people were all buried in one common ruin. It has been estimated that at least, we don't know for sure, at least 90,000 persons lost their lives on that fatal day. That was the first sign that Jesus gave of His impending return. He said, in Revelation 6, 12, through the Apostle John, that there would be a great earthquake when the sixth seal was opened. And then there was a second sign that was to follow after that. It's very interesting when you read the fulfillment of these prophecies. Jesus gave certain things that were to happen in order. They did happen in order. They happened in the exact order that Jesus gave them. This is interesting to me when I study prophecy because in prophecy many, many things are given in a certain sequence, in a certain order. If they happen, even if they were fulfilled, if they happened in the wrong sequence, every skeptic, every scoffer, every infidel in the world would say, see, it didn't happen like the Bible predicted it would happen. But they can't say that because these things did happen. They were fulfilled. Not only were they fulfilled, but they were fulfilled in the exact order that Jesus predicted they would happen. Notice what was going to happen next. In Revelation 6, 12, it says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Notice there's three things that are going to happen in order. One, there is to be a great earthquake. Number two, then the sun is going to be darkened. And then number three, then the moon is going to appear like blood. Now these three things happened in the exact order that Jesus said they would happen. We already saw the Lisbon earthquake occurred in 1755, the second great sign occurred, and you can read about this in your encyclopedia, it occurred about 25 years later. Stay tuned, we'll summarize it. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Welcome back. We read in Revelation 6.12 that the first sign after the opening of the sixth seal would be a great earthquake. And we saw that that great earthquake was fulfilled. That prediction of a great earthquake was fulfilled in the Lisbon earthquake, the greatest earthquake that has ever been recorded up to that time. That was in 1755. But notice there was a second sign that was to follow. The second sign was that there was to be a dark day. The sun was to be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. This sign occurred 25 years later. The first sign was centered in Europe. 
the second sign was centered in America. The darkening of the sun and the moon and called the dark day, if you look in an encyclopedia, what, rec what made this sign more interesting or more interesting to study for the Bible student is that Jesus pointed out a little window of time when this sign would have to occur. Notice what Jesus said. He says in Mark 13, 24, but in those days, now what are those days? It's those days of tribulation that he's been talking about. He says it's in those days, it's in those days of the great tribulation, the great tribulation, of course, was the 1260 year period of tribulation that Bible prophecy talks about over and over again when God's people would be persecuted. It talks about it in Daniel 7, 25. It talks about it again in Daniel 12. It talks about it again in Revelation 11, 2 and 3. It talks about it again in Revelation 12, 6. It talks about it again in Revelation 13, 5. This 1260 year period is so important that it is mentioned over and over again in Bible prophecy and it is referred to as a great tribulation for God's people. You can see that in Daniel 7, 25. You can see the same thing in Revelation 11, 12, and 13. And Jesus is talking about this period of great tribulation, which would end in 1798. And He says, in those days, in other words, before 1798, in those days after that tribulation. You see, Jesus promised that the tribulation would be shortened. Jesus said in verse 20, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom He chose, He shortened the days. So, Jesus said, in those days, that in other words, it would have to be before 1798, but after the tribulation, the tribulation was to be shortened. The terrible persecution of the dark ages was to come to an end a short time before 1798. So we would have to look at a period before 1798, but not too long before 1798, and it would have to be after 1755 when the first sign would appear. Jesus said, in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Did that happen between 1755 and 1798? Now, if it did not, then every skeptic Every scoffer in the world would say, see, Jesus Christ gave a sign that didn't come to pass. But the sign that Jesus gave did come to pass. And when did it come to pass? It came to pass right in that period of time after 1755 and before 1798. It happened in May 19, 1780. What happened at that time? Well, here's what one historian says. He says, almost if not altogether alone, as the most mysterious and as yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind stands the dark day of May 19, 1780. A most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and atmosphere in New England. Here's what an eyewitness in Massachusetts wrote about this event. He said, in the morning the sun rose clear but was soon overcast. The clouds became lowery, and from them, black and ominous, as they soon appeared, lightning flashed, thunder rolled, and a little rain fell. Toward nine o'clock, the clouds became thinner and assumed a brassy or coppery appearance. And earth, rocks, trees, buildings, water, and persons were changed by this strange, unearthly light. A few minutes later, a heavy black cloud spread over the entire sky except a narrow rim at the horizon. And it was as dark as it usually is at nine o'clock on a summer evening. So what happened? Here's what a historian says about it. Or this is eyewitness also. Fear, anxiety, and awe gradually filled the minds of the people. Women stood at the door looking out upon the dark landscape. Men returned from their labor in the fields. The carpenter left his tools, the blacksmith his forge, the tradesman his counter. Schools were dismissed, and tremblingly the children fled homeward. Travelers put up at the nearest farmhouse. What is coming was everybody's question. Candles were used. 
Hearth fires shone as brightly as on a moonless evening in autumn. Fowls, the birds, retired to their roosts and went to sleep. Cattle gathered at the pasture bars and lowed. Frogs peeped. Birds sang their evening songs and bats flew about. But the human knew that night had not come. Dr. Nathaniel Whitaker, pastor of the Tabernacle Church in Salem, held religious services, and he maintained that the darkness was supernatural. The darkness was most dense shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning. In most parts of the country, the darkness was so great in the daytime that the people could not tell the hour by either watch or clock, nor dine, nor manage their domestic business without the light of candles. Here's what a, an, another eyewitness says about it. it. says, the extent of this darkness was extraordinary. It was observed as far east as Falmouth. To the westward, it reached to the farthest part of Connecticut and to Albany. To the southward, it was observed along the seacoast, and to the north as far as American settlements extend. Now, the intense darkness of that day was succeeded by what happened at night. A dark, heavy mist still covered the sky. Concerning the night, eyewitnesses said, nor was the darkness of the night less uncommon and terrifying than that of the day. Notwithstanding, there was almost a full moon. No object was discernible but by the help of some artificial light. Here's what another eyewitness said. I could not help conceiving at the time that if every luminous body in the universe had been shrouded in unpenetrable shades or struck out of existence, the darkness could not have been more complete. At nine o'clock that night, the moon rose, but it did not have the least effect to dispel the death-like shadows. And after midnight, when the darkness partially disappeared and the moon, when it first became visible, had the appearance of blood, exactly as Jesus predicted would happen. First, there would be an earthquake. Second, there would be a dark day and then the sun would not give its light and then the moon would appear as blood. May 19, 1780 stands in history, you can read it in any historical work or encyclopedia, as the dark day. Since the time of Moses, no period of darkness of equal density, extent, and duration has ever been recorded. The description of this event as given by eyewitnesses is simply an echo of the words of our Lord recorded not only by Matthew and Mark and described by John the Revelator in Revelation 6:12, but this was to be so significant that it was even recorded in the Old Testament hundreds of years before Christ came. Notice what it says. This was written 2,500 years ago in Joel, the second chapter. It says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, Jesus told his disciples, he said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, notice what Jesus said here in Luke 21, 28. He says, now when these things begin to happen, Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. When they are already budding, that's the trees, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you likewise, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. The trouble was though, friends, it's just like it was when Jesus came the first time. The spirit of humility and devotion in the church had given place to pride and formalism. Love for Christ and for His coming had grown cold because people were absorbed in worldliness and pleasure-loving. 
and the professed people of God were so blinded to the Savior's instructions concerning the signs of His appearing and the doctrine of the second advent had been so much neglected by the churches that the scriptures were obscured by misinterpretation. So to a great extent, the signs that Jesus gave were ignored or forgotten. Especially was this the case in the churches of America because this was a land where people enjoyed freedom and comfort. All classes enjoyed this and people had an ambitious desire for wealth and luxury. And this fostered a, an intense devotion to money making and an eager rush in America for popularity and power, which seemed to be within the reach of everybody. And so what was the result? The result was that men began to center their interests and their hopes on the things of this life, just as they are doing today, and to put far off in the future that solemn day when the present order of things should pass away. When Jesus spoke to His disciples about these signs that they were, should watch for, He also predicted the condition in the church in these last days. It's found in Matthew 24 and in Luke or, or in Mark 13, but we'll read it from Luke 17. This is what Jesus predicted would be the condition in the church in these last days, exactly as we see it today. Notice what Jesus said would happen. He said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Oh, friend, Jesus knew. He predicted what would be the condition among His professed followers in the last days. We have been living in the last days for over 200 years. We are approaching the end of the world. How is it with your soul, friend? Are you totally absorbed in making money, in buying and planting and all the different things in this world? Is that, is that taking up your total time and your attention or are you getting ready for the end of the world? Jesus said, when you see these things, look up. Be prepared. Be ready. We hope you have enjoyed today's program. Today's free book is entitled The End of the World. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC32. When the last trump sounds and Christ comes to take His faithful people home, will you be among that group? Are you a part of the final generation who will live to see Christ come? How can you know? If you are part of the final generation, what must you do to ensure that He is coming for you? Over and over again, the Bible warns us of the deceptions to come upon the world in the last days. And if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. To receive your free book, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788 and ask for offer GC32. From all of us here at Steps to Life Ministries, may God richly bless you as you seek to learn more of His truth. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.